and welcome to the third lecture of the module Decision Making for Autonomous Robots here at the University of Bonn. My name is Maria and in this lecture we tap into the essence of artificial intelligence, how we can get robots to reason about their environments and decide for themselves where to go in order to perform useful actions. We start with an introduction to the decision making problem and its key components. Then we look at Markov decision processes, which is a general framework for solving uh, tasks of sequential decision making. And finally, we look how we can solve these in order to get the best possible actions so that the robots can execute their mission successfully. To start off, let's revisit some of the examples of autonomous system that we have seen in the previous lecture. So in the previous lecture about planning, we look how we can drive these robots to a particular point in their environment so that they can execute a specific task. In this lecture, we take things a step further and look at higher level autonomy. So can these robots decide for themselves where to actually go in order to perform the most useful actions according to their mission objectives? This will take us steps closer towards true robot autonomy, where robots are essentially doing everything for themselves without us telling them where to go. So to make these um, more concrete, let's have a look at these robots one by one and decide which types of decisions they have to make in their respective missions. So first we have this UAV on the top left here that's surveying an agricultural field. And the mission might be to map um, the weed distribution on the field and as such the robot has to navigate to particular viewpoints where it can observe the weeds more closely. And thus the decisions that we want to decide, uh, design for this robot should be based on that objective. Then we have an autonomous vehicle here um, that's navigating on a road and it has to decide which ways to move in order to avoid collisions with pedestrians that might be emerging on the roads. This is essential for, for safe and robust operation. Next, uh, we see a fixed wing uh, UAV here whose performance in terms of uh, flight is highly influenced by the weather conditions. And so the decision here should be associated with um, is it possible to steer the vehicle to avoid, for example, high wind conditions where its performance is degraded? Next, we have this very cute um, humanoid robot whose task is to receive and welcome new visitors in a museum environment. So the questions here are, how should this robot respond to visitors and where are the visitors? Um, in the next row we have um, a different domain, an autonomous uh, surface vehicle that's navigating on a lake and that needs to monitor, for example, bacteria concentration. And here the choices to make are which way should um, this type of robot navigate, should it go forwards or move to the side in order to collect the most useful measurements in this type of monitoring scenario. Um, next, we have a multi-robot problem where we have a swarm of small UAVs um, that are tasked, for example, to pick up um, and place items in their environment. So if these robots are all operating in the same volume or space, how should they move in order to avoid collisions with each other? And finally, we have a robot manipulator here um, whose job is to inspect um, sweet peppers in a greenhouse area. So the mission is how should the robot uh, move its manipulator and end effector in order to observe the peppers most efficiently in this cluttered environment where there are lots of occlusions with the leaves and so on. So this is just to provide some substance on uh, the types of decisions that we consider when we talk about decision making. Um, here is another example, which we come back to in this lecture, as well as later on in the module, which is about robotic exploration. And so here we see a top-down view of an environment, and on the bottom right we see a UAV um, pose um, associated with it, and uh, that's starting in this unknown environment, so nothing is mapped in the start. 
And during the mission, the robot receives images from a depth camera that we'll be able to see here on the top left that are associated with a particular viewpoint. And we say that starting in this unknown environment, we want the robots to map the area as quickly as possible. This would be very relevant, for example, for inspection applications if we want to simply deploy this UAV and in the maximum and the minimum possible time get the most information out of an unknown area and see everything. So if we play the video now, we can see the UAV, so represented by this transform, is moving to explore this very complicated maze-like environment, uh, looking at all the corners. And this is essentially because we formulate a decision-making objective that steers it towards uh, observing unobserved unknown space. So this, in this case, uh, would correspond to the mission aim and what we want the decision-making algorithm to achieve. Good, so with these examples in mind, the decision-making um, problem can be formulated um, in a very simple way. So if the robot is starting in a location A, which location B should it go to, so where in the environment, in order to execute its task with respect to its mission objectives? So the, basically, as we will see, the uh, location of B is highly dependent on what we actually want the robot to do, what we consider as being a good in terms of the mission. So um, just to draw a contrast here between decision making in this lecture and planning, which we have covered in the previous lecture, in decision-making, we talk about where the robot should go, so it's a very high-level decision that we have to make. Whereas in planning, we gave the robot a start configuration and a goal configuration, and we asked it to plan a path from the start to the goal that was collision-free. So these are, um, using a very simple illustration, the key differences between these two terms for the purposes of this module. Now, in the next step, you might say, well, when we talked about motion planning, remember we had the classical path planning problem, which um, seek to find the shortest path from a start configuration to a goal configuration. We were also doing decision making. So isn't planning and decision making quite similar? Because in that case, we were talking about, for example, um, connected roadmaps in the environment uh, through which the robot can move. And we had to decide how we can essentially connect the edges of this graph to take the robot from the start to the goal in a collision-free manner. So isn't this decision-making? And the answer is yes. So motion planning is essentially sequential decision-making. But in this module, we draw the difference um, simply because decision-making is a more general and more higher level um, task of robot autonomy and we want to draw the differences here so that we can tackle these two problems in a different way. So how is the content of this lecture different and what kind of uh, problems are we looking at here? So we have several aspects of decision making to keep in mind uh, throughout the remainder of this lecture. So first we consider a variety of objective functions which we'll also see are called rewards. So the approaches uh, to decision-making that we will consider here cover a wide variety of problems and we can specify different mission objectives that we want our decision-making algorithm to do. And this is exactly what we saw in the previous examples with the different robots operating in different environments to perform their missions. Whereas in path planning, we were mostly looking at in classical path planning, the shortest path problem. So there was one objective is simply uh, in the minimum possible length, get the robot from the start to the goal. Another key and very crucial aspect is uncertainty. So in the planning lecture, we identified uncertainty as being a very important factor in real world robotic um, situations. And we talked about how there exists actuation uncertainty, remember this is associated with the robot control, and also sensing uncertainty associated with the measurements um, 
that it takes in its environment. And we when we developed various planning algorithms, we also expressed some consideration as to how we can cater for these sources of uncertainty in a practical way. For example, when we briefly uh, touched on the search-based algorithms, we looked at possible ways of increasing um, the geometry, inflating its geometry um, of the robot as well as of the obstacles in order to give us more clearance to avoid potential collision with the environments in case there is some actuation uncertainty. And so in this case, if you want the robot uh, to go very close to an obstacle in our planning problem, we avoid a collision occurring because we add that extra safety margin by increasing its size when we do the actual planning. However, this is a simple consideration and we didn't discuss planning algorithms that actually bake these sources of uncertainty into the planning algorithm itself. So when we were talking about the shortest path planning problem, we looked at algorithms that did not account for uncertainty when they generated the actual plan. So there was no knowledge of that, for example, when we applied search-based methods to find the shortest path on a graph, because we said that our vertices and edges of that graph, so the collision-free connections, are fixed. So we gave them no potential to move other than these heuristic rules we applied to add an extra safety layer. And the difference is that in this lecture about decision making, we'll look at especially actuation uncertainty and how that could be incorporated directly into the decision making algorithm. This is very different to uh, simply adding that extra safety layer. And finally, uh, just to make it uh, completely clear that when we talk about decision making here, we refer to discrete problems. This is similar to planning because in the planning lecture we also looked at how we can convert um, the continuous configuration space into a discrete uh, concise representation so that we can apply for example search based methods on. And with this bullet point it's just to make clear that decision making also deals specifically with discrete problems in terms of the discrete uh, states the problem can have and also discrete uh, set of actions that the robot can take. Good, so now that we understand the differences for planning between planning and decision making, for the purposes of this module, we can move in to define some key terms for the decision making problem that we keep coming back to later. So these terms are very crucial to understand now because later on uh, when we get into the mathematical formulations they keep coming up and we have to make sure we really understand them fully and what they represent. So first of all we have um, what we call the agent which is the learner and the decision maker. In robotic applications this is essentially the robot. So the agent is um, a representation of the actor. So this is what we can control. This is the decisions that we want to optimize for that particular mission. And as we will see, the agent has also actuators that it can use to apply these actions, as well as sensors so that it can receive observations and feedback from the environment. Now, what is the environment? So the environment is simply put everything outside the agent. So it is this outside world that's sending feedback, observations, as well as rewards. It is also that which the agent acts upon. This is essentially the world in which the agent lives and operates. Now, there are some other terms here. So we spoke about actions or decisions. So these are essentially the choices that the agents make. And as we said, we have a finite set of these. So a very simple action is, um, just as we saw in the illustration, if the agent has two potential places that it can go to, then one of them would represent an action. Agent moving from one point to another. Another key element is the observation. 
The observation is essentially all the information that the agent receives from the environment at a particular point in time. So it's like in, in a perception system, as in the depth camera that we saw in the video, one a depth image is essentially an observation. This is all that the agent uh, receives about the environment at that particular point in time. And here it's important to note that there might be other things happening in the environment that are outside the observation. For example, outside of the field of view of the camera. But we, in our, when we develop the intelligence and the decision-making algorithms, we don't have any knowledge of these things, so they're not important. We only care about the observation is essentially a snapshot of what the agent sees of the world at a particular point. And finally, um, as we discuss more in the next slide, we have the so-called reward. So this reward is a fundamental quantity in decision making. It tells us basically how good is an agent doing at a particular point in time. This is a scalar, a real value, and essentially a feedback signal. And this feedback signal should be defined in such a way to reflect the agent's goal or the agent's mission objective. Let's talk about this in some more detail. So here we just added a subscript T to say that if the agent is a, at a particular point in time, so this time step, how well is the agent doing? So how does its action map to goodness or the usefulness of its actions? This is what we call the reward. And the goal of decision making is essentially to maximize the expected cumulative future reward. What do we mean by cumulative? So this is um, when the agent executes a sequence of actions. If we add up the rewards associated with all of these actions, for example, moving between different points, this, is, this will be the cumulative reward. And our objective is simply to find the greatest possible sum. So we want the best possible scenario in which the agent finds the most reward. And we also add the word expectation here because these rewards may not be deterministic. So as we will see later, we will have some probabilistic aspects of the decision-making problem and we need to account for all the possible uh, futures when the robot is execute, ex executing its actions and bake them into an expectation. So the goal is uh, with respect to those probabilities to maximize the expected cumulative reward. Let's have a look at some examples of how this works. So um, what the reward could be in a particular scenario. So remember in the video where we, we saw a UAV exploring an unknown environment such as a maze? We would want higher rewards associated with finding unobserved areas in this space. So if we position the camera of the robot at a particular viewpoint and we can um, project it and uh, determine that for a particular viewpoint we uncover more unobserved space, we would want more reward there because from that viewpoint the agent will see more and explore more. And if the mission in this case is to explore the area as quickly as possible, then our reward is successfully reflecting that objective because we say that the more new things we see, the more successful our um, exploration mission is. Along slightly different lines, um, we could also consider a reward, for example, for a control application where we're trying to learn the control mechanism of a quadrotor, for example. And we look at what's happening when we optimize different parameters of the control strategy. And in this case, we want a higher reward when the control exhibits stability. So when the position and its derivatives are stable. This means we're doing good in the control uh, mechanism, so we have a higher reward. And we want um, to optimize with respect to that. Uh, finally, another monitoring example is that surface we vehicle that we saw on the lake. So in this case, if we're monitoring, for example, um, bacteria concentration in a lake, 
And we say that um, from a scientific point of view, we want to get more information about areas um, in the lake that have high bacteria. Then we need a reward which is, it essentially tells the robot when it's seeing uh, high, con high bacteria concentration areas, this is where you get more reward. And so the agent will essentially learn that these are the places in the environment that it needs to navigate to. So these are some very intuitive um, examples of how rewards actually work in practice. And just as we said, um, these uh, rewards can be quite diverse and reflect a variety of different missions and applications. Now just on a point to make here is that the reward can be also defined in very different ways. So because the reward is a scalar and a real value, it can also be negative. For example, if we want the robot to reach a particular goal location in the environment, we could say that the agent should have negative reward in all possible um, configurations apart from the goal. That could be one option. Or we could gradually increase the, uh, the reward the closer the agent get, reaches the goal. And this is a de design decision that we have to make which will essentially reflect how the agent will learn the best actions to take in the decision-making problem. So now moving on to the actual decision-making aspect. So we've talked about rewards and we've talked about the problem setup. The simplest possible decision-making is single-stage decision-making. This is when the agent just has to decide one action to take and it's done. So the mission is complete. So for example, for this robot, if it can go to any three of these locations, there should be a reward associated with all three of them. And then it simply picks the one that leads to the highest reward. And that's all the um, optimal action equation is saying here. Just pick the action A that gives the maximum expected reward. However, in real world applications, as well as in life, things are much more complicated. So we don't just make one decision, but we make several. So the robot not only has to decide on the first action to take, but also on the next one and possibly the ones after that. There is a much longer horizon for the decisions that it makes. And so that's where the sequential part actually comes in. We have to maximize the total expected uh, future reward or the cumulative reward. And this is um, different, obviously, to the single stage decision making and also much more challenging. So one challenge is that what the agent does in the short term might not be the best possible thing to do um, in that sense, but it might lead to possible situations where the agent can experience more reward in the future. So we need a decision-making algorithm that actually accounts for this trade-off. Maybe it's better to give up some reward now in order to get more later. Another aspect is that um, actions also depend on what is observed. So um, depending on the actions that the agent takes in the short term, in the long term, the short term actions might actually be influenced by them. So due to this uh, interconnectivity of the actions on the temporal scale, the problem of sequential decision making is actually quite tricky. And we're going to look at how we can solve it. So now that we understand where the time aspect comes in, let's have a look at the loop of interactions um, as to how the agent and the environment interact during the mission. So here we understand um, the different stages as well as where the different um, elements of the decision making um, actually come in. So at, we introduce the time step T here. So at a particular point in time, the agent will perform an action on the environment and at the same time the environment will emit an observation, remember a snapshot 
um, a piece of information about the environment to the agent and it will also emit the reward. So basically how good its action was. And now if we increment one step further, corresponding to the action um, at time step t, the environment will emit a new observation and a new reward to the agent. So this is what is represented here by this transparent arrows. These are from the previous time step. So one a very important thing is how this time variable is actually incremented. So the time variable uh, in this lecture is increment, incremented when the environment emits something. So the reward and the observation here correspond to the action AT. So when the environment receives an action, then it sends out a new observation and a new reward. And so it's really important to understand um, w the cause and effect, so to say, of these, um, these different variables. And there are different ways of defining them, um, but this is the convention that we will use for the purposes of this lecture and that will come up later in the math. Note that it's not always done this way. So if you read some uh, related work, the way that the time is treated could be uh, slightly different and from the perspective of the agent. But important thing to take away here is that the reward and the observation at t plus one actually correspond to action at. So these um, variables are the ones that correspond to this particular action. So this tells us about the continual interaction between the agent and the environment. It also defines the experience of the agent. So when the agent is doing something, how does that influence um, its observations and state as well as the reward? So now that we understand uh, this loop, um, let's talk about uncertainty again. So we mentioned sources of uncertainty that we want to account for in robotic applications. So that was the actuation uncertainty, which is associated with the robot control. So when we move the robot to a particular point or tell it to move there, how certain are we that the robot actually uh, reached that particular location and didn't deviate from the path? And the second sort, uh, source of uncertainty is that in the observations. So how accurate are the measurements that the robot takes from its environment? For example, are there any holes in the depth image, um, for example, or is the noise coming from laser data um, significant that we need to take it into account? So in decision making and the framework that we develop in this lecture, we want to focus on this first type of uncertainty, which is the uncertainty in robotic actions and how we can model that. And we want to take this concept and tie it in with our loop of decision making that we just discussed. So not considering deterministic actions where everything happens perfectly, but we want some kind of model to capture the uncertainty in the robot actions and allow it to make decisions with respect to that. So how is this done? So here we talk about um, state transitions. So now we introduce um, the concept of the state. So a state is basically all the information about a particular decision-making scenario that the agent needs to take into account when it wants to execute a new action. So it defines all the information in order to make the next decision. It also corresponds to all the observations that are made in that particular state. So one example of a state could be for um, a robot navigating in the building is which room is the robot in. In a grid type of environment, this could be the cell that the robot is in. Or it could even be, for example, the X and Y coordinates associated with the robot moving in a plane. But for the purposes of this lecture, we consider the state, as we said, to be a discrete set. So there is a finite number of discrete states 
and we can also uh, more or less enumerate all of them um, in a computational way. So um, given a state, how does the robot actually move between these states? For example, how does it move from one a grid cell to the next or from one room to the next? So here we define this concept of the transition model. So the transition model is simply the probability um, that uh, a particular action in a state will lead to a successive state. So we'll have a look at an example in a minute, but if a robot is in a particular state and it executes an action, how likely is it to end up in a next state? That's all there is to the transition model. So we can represent a transition model either using a T as such or a probability, because as we will see, this is a probabilistic distribution over the possible states. And um, one key um, property that we also need to define here is the Markov property. So what is the Markov property? We're saying that the transition probabilities uh, when the robot is in a particular state only depend on the state and the action it takes at that particular point in time. So if we know the state that the robot is in and the actions, then we can develop the transition model for a next state. So essentially, we don't care about what happened in the past. So which initial state the robot was in and all the actions that led up to this point. We say that according to this Markov assumption, these variables are irrelevant. So it's simply a one-step type of probability that we're considering. This is an important assumption to make here and will play a key role when we develop uh, the Markov decision process um, for uh, solving decision-making problems. So now we want to talk about the different types of state transitions that we have. So how we can represent um, the probability of that transition model. So we have a look at two different types of state transitions. So one of them is deterministic. And this is what we considered in the planning lecture as well. This is saying that if we execute a particular action, that the robot will go to uh, from a particular state. The probability that the robot will go to a next state successfully according to the intention of this action is one. So there is a delta function there that says the robot is guaranteed to end up in the next state. So essentially for this example, if you have a robot in a cell and we tell it to go down, that actually happens. The probability is one and the probability the robot ends up in any of these adjacent cells or anywhere else in the environment, any other state, this is zero because the action is um, purely deterministic, the state transition is purely deterministic. So in contrast, when we have a stochastic state transition, what happens is we're not sure. And this is where uncertainty and actuation comes in. So in a stochastic transition, if we tell the robot to move down one cell, starting from the same cell as before, we might have a very high probability that the robot actually executes this successfully, for example, 0 0.8. But there, are also, there could also be small probabilities that the robot ends up in the adjacent cells. So um, either to the left or to the right, say, for example, 0 0.1 probability. And this type of representation what it does is essentially captures the fact that our actions are uncertain. So when we do something in contrast to the deterministic case, it's not perfect, but we actually have a probabil probability distribution over where that action might lead us to end up. And so the robot would have to then decide um, on the next actions from one of these possible futures. So we can um, put this into a table just to uh, represent the transition function more explicitly. 
So as we said, um, the state is all the information that we need in order to make a particular decision. And in the case of a grid world, we could have four distinct states here. So for example, S1 as to where the robot was starting, S2 to the left, S3 to the bottom, and S4 to the right. And so if we plug in um, this to our transition model, where our action is one step down, what we get is actually a table where the probability if we're starting in S1 of ending up in any of these other states, uh, we actually know, and this is something that we specify and we can simply put in. So one important note to make here is it's important that the probabilities do sum up to one because the robot will definitely end up in one of these states even if the same state repeats again and the robot doesn't move. Um, it's important that um, something actually happens and that we do uh, realize one of these possible futures for the robot. And these concepts are very similar to the robot motion model um, which basically says that if actuation, if the robot controls is imperfect, we can probabilistically model this. And so we have actual numbers in terms of probability distribution that a particular action will lead us to a particular outcome. And next we look at putting all of these concepts together in the Markov decision process and how we can use this to solve decision making problems. Now that we understood the key elements of decision making and how they interact, we can put them together into a general framework for solving sequential decision making problems called the Markov Decision Process or the MDP. The MDP is a general framework with stochastic control that's used not only in robotics but in a variety of other applications where decision making is required. And before we delve into the mathematics, Let's look at the name Markov Decision Process and what these words actually mean individually. So first we have the word process, and this simply refers to the fact that things happen over time, step by step. So if the agent is in a particular state, then it transitions to another state. And as we discussed, we can model this using the state transition function, which represents a probabilistic distribution. Next we have the word Markov, and this relates to our Markov assumption that the state and the action at a particular point in time are the only things that govern the future of that agent. In other words, we can simply disregard the past history and past trajectory. Finally, a key element is the word decision here, and this refers to our agent being an actor and decision maker. It makes decisions that we want to optimize in order to maximize the expected cumulative reward we can get in the future. It is also these decisions that govern the evolution of the process in the future, which transitions will happen. So what assumptions do we need to make in order to formulate an MDP? Well, first we say, that the environment that the agent is operating in is fully observable. In other words, there is no ambiguity and no uncertainty regarding its state. We can fully trust its observations. This is an assumption we make now and relax in later, re later re lectures when we talk about partial observability. But for now, we only consider uncertainty in actuation and disregard sensing uncertainty. Secondly, we have the mark of dynamics, which we just discussed, saying that the history of the agent is independent from its future. Thirdly, we have um, assumption of stochastic transitions. It means we have a probabilistic distributions of the outcomes of future actions, which we represent with the state transition model. And finally, we assume that the actions and the decisions made by the agent are stationary. So in other words, they don't depend on the particular time. With this, we can now formulate an MDP. 
So an MVP is firstly defined by a finite state of actions that the agent can make and a finite set of states. As we said, these are discrete. Then we have state transition probabilities, which are essentially probabilistic mappings from one state to the next. And this is represented by the transition model. If the agent is in one state, what is the probability that will enter the next? And finally, we have this reward function, which maps the state of an agent and its action at a particular time to an expected reward. So in this equation, we formulate the reward generally so that it can depend on the state as well as the action, but in practice, it may, for example, only depend on the state. We also include the expectation here to account for the fact that the reward in general may not be deterministic. So one note to make on notation here, as we move deeper into the maths, is that we use these calligraphic symbols in order to represent a state, so all the possibilities. Then, with the uppercase um, italic, we represent a random variable. And the lowercase represents, as in conventional um, probability, a, a realization of that particular random variable. And this is the notation that we'll be using throughout this module. So now that we um, understand what goes into the MDP, we can introduce this concept of returns. So when we talked about decision making, our aim, uh, we said, was to maximize the expected cumulative reward. And now we can name this expected cumulative reward simply the returns. So it's similar to investment. When you make an investment, what are the returns that you can expect in the future? Here also the agent is investing, so to say, in a particular action, and we have to study what are the potential gains, the potential returns it can acquire from taking that action or a sequence of actions. And when we formulate these returns, we're going to discuss two different and distinct types of tasks, episodic tasks and continuous tasks. Starting with episodic tasks, these are tasks that have a clear start and an end. They uh, last for a particular number of time steps, for example, t. They have a finite horizon. And in order to calculate the returns, all we have to do is add the returns that we get from each of the steps, uh, time steps in the future. There is a clear start and a clear termination of an episodic um, decision-making task that ends with the terminal state. After this, it's game over and there's no more return and no more actions that the agent can make. This um, example of this is, for example, if the robot um, has to navigate towards a particular goal. So when it reaches the goal, the mission is complete. In contrast, continuing tasks are ones which keep going on an infinite horizon. So there is no clear end and no terminal state. These um, types of tasks are never ending and simply we can keep incrementing the time step forever. A good example is if we want um, a robot to execute a persistent monitoring task. Persistent monitoring is when the robot has to reobserve parts of the environment. So for example, for the surface vehicle on the lake, um, it can continuously go back and reobserve the locations it has seen before if enough time has elapsed in order to get new measurements from that area until, um, of course, it's out of battery. So one problem we have here is that the returns in this case are never ending because we can simply keep uh, going, keep summing the reward, and therefore we have infinite returns. So mathematically and practically in order to account for this is we, use, we introduce what's called a discount factor gamma here. So in each future step, we add a multiplication by one of these gammas and we can formulate the sum as such for all the future returns. 
gamma is useful because it allows us to tune the value of short-sighted and far-sighted rewards. Gamma is a value between 0 and 1. So when the gamma, the discount factor, is 0, then we have a nearsighted, or what's called a myopic agent. So essentially, all these future rewards will fall out, and we simply left with the one-step look-ahead, so the agent only cares about the next reward that it's going to get. So in other words, it's very greedy, and it's acting in exactly the same way as the single-stage decision-maker, not caring about the implications of its future actions and only looking one step ahead. Um, when gamma is close to 1, we have a very far-sighted agent because we value highly the rewards that we could possibly get in the future. So essentially, this gamma discounts or deprecates the value of future rewards, and according to the mission, we can set how much we want to balance between nearsighted and farsighted behavior. So why do we need this gamma? So as we already hinted, this uh, value is important because we can actually have a converging value of returns. So we can estimate the value associated with a particular state or action because we have a finite sum corresponding to a continuing task. Also, um, if the agent executes many actions and uh, many time se steps proceed, then uncertainties might accumulate over time and future rewards might be uncertain. So what this discount factor does is essentially it accounts for that because it's saying that in the future we may not be sure as to what the rewards will be so we can discount them by a particular factor. And finally, it's very similar to the way that humans naturally behave. So we tend to prefer immediate reward and future re rewards are less interesting for us. So now we can talk about an important concept, which is the policy or the decision. So leading up to this, we were looking at the implications of actions and the states and how we can model them. And now we come to the core, which is the policy of the agent, the decisions that it has to take in order to maximize its expected cumulative rewards. In the MDP, we represent this by what's called a policy, pi. A policy is what determines the agent's behavior and tells it how to behave. So essentially, a policy is a mapping between the agent's states and its agent's actions. So if we know which state an agent is in, our policy tells us what to do. It's like a rule book. We can simply look up at a particular state which actions we want to take and then apply those. And the goal of the MDP, as we would expect, is to find a good policy. So we want a rule book that tells us if you're in a state, take a particular action that will lead you to very high returns in the future. We will consider two types of policies. It's important to distinguish them. So we have what's called a deterministic policy, which is essentially um, the action is a function of a state deterministically. So this is simple. This is like a lookup table and a rule book that tells us, so if you're in this state, do that, and that's it. There is no uncertainty, there is no concept of uh, probabilistic action, it is simply one-to-one -one mapping between the two. So if a robot is in a particular cell in its environment, the rule might be just directly navigate towards the goal. In contrast, a stochastic policy is probabilistic, so when we're in a particular state, we may take a particular action and this may is modeled by a probabilistic transition. So in other words, our action in a particular uh, a time instant is conditioned by the state. This is what we mean when we say stochastic policy. And this connects extremely well to the transition model that we just discussed which also had deterministic and stochastic variance. 
Except um, a key difference here is that the policy is actually something that we're in control over. So this is where the decision making and the planning comes in. Whereas the state transition model is something that is there, it's governed by the environment and the aspects of the problem. The policy is the actual parameter, the variable that we want to optimize when we do decision making. Here it's also helpful to distinguish between policies and plans, which we discussed in the previous lecture about planning. So a plan is a sequence of actions. It tells the robot what to do. So it has to follow a particular path. It has to follow a particular edges on a graph. This is what we call a plan. And a plan is simply executed. So the robot cannot react to anything that happens unless it has a local planner that uh, on a low level um, reacts to unexpected outcomes or avoids collisions. But in general, the plan um, on a high level cannot be modified. This is something that we tell, we give the agent, and we say, do that particular sequence of actions. In contrast, a policy, um, our rule book tells the agent how to act from any state. This is very different because it doesn't depend on a sequence. It is reactive and at a particular time instant, we can look at the state the agent finds itself and simply take an action. That's our policy there. So policies are much more flexible. So with that, we come to um, value functions. So we talked about decisions and how we can represent them using a policy, how we can map states to actions via the policy, we also talked about returns, which is um, how useful are the rewards that we can get in the future. And a natural question to ask next is what is the value of a particular state? Of what is the value of a particular state and a particular action at that state? And this is where we introduce uh, two fundamental concepts of value within value functions. So first we have um, state value functions. So this is simply the expected return starting from a state and following a policy. So here mathematically we have state value which is the expectation over the policy given that the agent is in a state which returns will we get. So it depends on the state and we take the expectation over the policy because our policy may not be deterministic. We might have probabilities associated with taking particular actions and this is why we need the expectation. And obviously what we're interested in is the returns, so how much reward the agent can get in the future from that state and so this is the variable that actually defines the value, the usefulness or the utility. And here we have simply expanded this into a sum by substituting the definition of returns for the continuing task case. Analogously, we can formulate um, an action value function. This is extremely similar, except now, in addition to starting from a state, the, uh, the agent is also taking a particular action. So, um, again, we take the expectation over the policy because this action may not be deterministic. It could be stochastic. So that's why we have the expectation operator. And in addition, we also condition on the action. So all the possible actions that the agent can take from a particular state. And once again, we can sum, uh, substitute the definition of the returns here, which is what we're interested in and which is what defines our value. One interesting thing to note here is though we talked about the expectations due to our policies being um, deterministic and um, the uncertainty associated with that, these value functions, the state value and the action value are actually uh, deterministic. So these are numbers that tell us how useful a state or a state action pair is. 
And so this brings us into a very fundamental concept uh, in MDPs that we need to solve them. This is called the Bellman equation, and it is based on the idea of recursive decomposition. So we'll go through this now. Now that we understand our state value function, which is the potential returns the agent can get from being in a state, we say that we can break it down. We can break it down into two parts, the immediate reward that the agent gets from executing an action, and also the discounted state value of its successor state. This simply means that if I have um, a return from my particular state where I'm at now, and I take one step into the future, I also have obviously a state value from the new state, and if I add that new state value and the return that I just got from taking one step, this will be the same as the sta state value of the initial state. So we just, we just broke it down. We decomposed by taking one action by itself and looking at the future returns from the next state that action leads to. So let's look at the maths here. We start with our state value function. Then we just substitute uh, the definition of return. So this is all the re rewards that we can get in the future, including our discount factor gamma, which we remember deprecates the values of future rewards. Then we just isolated the gamma here. So we took the first reward, which is not discounted by itself, and we factored out one of the discount um, factors here um, using the brackets. And now we observe that, well, this what's in the brackets is actually the returns of the next step. So it's not the returns I currently have, but it's the returns um, if I just took one step and look at what I could potentially gain there. So we added, um, we substituted that for the new returns and we notice that this actually corresponds to our value of the next state. So this essentially um, tells us that um, the state value function can be decomposed into two separate parts, the immediate reward associated with taking one step and the discounted value of the next state. And again, we take the expectations here. This is a really fundamental concept, it's very important to understand, and it's what will allow us to solve the MDP next. But it's also very intuitive, because um, this is what one would expect if we just simply split a very complicated problem with many different steps into one step plus the rest of the steps. So similarly, we can also do this for the action value function. So if we follow through the derivation in exactly the same way, this um, is the formulation that we will, we will be getting. And these are the two Bellman equations um, that are associated with our MDP, where we applied the principles of recursive de um, decomposition to develop a subproblem for the state value and action value functions the state value corresponding to the value um, potential cumulative uh, reward or returns associated with being in a state and the state action value corresponding with the state as well as the action from that point on. So naturally uh, the optimal value of a state and the optimal value of a state action pair will be the policy or the action that leads us to get the maximum possible value from these. So the best possible policy that we can get is the one that gets us the most returns. And this is the actual variable when we plan that we want to optimize for. What is the best policy that will lead us to get the most possible rewards? The optimal policy is therefore the action that we should follow, given that we're in a state, when we get the most value from it. And this is again very intuitive to understand if we remember that what our agent wants to do is maximize its expected cumulative reward. 
So the more award the agent gets, the better it's doing. And these are ways in which we can um, quantify this and develop formulations with respect to these variables of actions and states that we have introduced within the MDP. And next we look at how to use these Bellman equations and concepts of optimality in order to solve the MDP and find the optimal policies so that the robot can find uh, the best solutions to its decision-making problem and execute successful missions. And now let us use the ideas of Bellman's equation and optimality in order to find the best possible policy for our agent and decision maker. This is one that yields the highest cumulative reward. To do this, we'll be using principles from dynamic programming, specifically methods of value and policy iteration. As first of all, what is dynamic programming? Well, we can get an understanding just by looking at the name again. So the word dynamic refers to the fact that our problem is sequential and there is a temporal aspect to it. And the word programming refers to the fact that what we're trying to do is optimize or program a policy for our decision maker. Essentially, the optimal policy is placed in the sequential context of the problem. And by nature of these actions, the agent is effectively changing the process that's underlying the MDP in order to obtain the maximum possible cumulative reward in the future when it's starting from a particular state. The basic idea of dynamic programming is to take a large complicated problem that is tough to solve and breaking down into smaller individual subproblems. We can then solve these uh, individual subproblems and combine their solutions together in order to obtain a solution to the larger problem as a whole. In order to do this, and for dynamic programming, our problem needs to satisfy two key requirements. First, we need to obey the principle of optimality. Our problem needs to have an optimal substructure. So for example, if we solve for the shortest path from an intermediate point to the goal, that solution will still be valid when we try to find the shortest path from a start to the goal when passing through the intermediate configuration. Secondly, we need to have so-called overlapping subproblems so that subproblems recur many times. This is again relevant in the path planning problem because if we solve from an intermediate point to the goal, we can effectively cache this uh, solution when we want to find the shortest path for any, from any starting state passing through this point. So fortunately for us, MDPs satisfy both of these requirements. The principle of optimality is evident from Bellman's equation that tells us that the optimal state value from one state is simply the immediate reward plus the optimal state value from the successor state. Moreover, the overlapping subproblems requirement is satisfied by the definition of value functions. So if we know the value of a particular state or state action, we can simply cache the solution and reuse it whenever we want to solve the MDP. So how can we solve for the optimal policy? Uh, to start off, let's try a naive approach. We start with our uh, definition of the optimal state value function, and we can break it down according to the definition that we had. Here again, we have the expectation over the policy accounting for the probabilistic nature of actions and state transitions. And what we do here in the third line is we simply uh, replace such that we isolate the expectations with respect to the state transition, where here we have our, the probabilistic version of our state transition function. So we can take the expectation over all possible successor states that the robot could be in and multiply them by the optimal state value from there. So this solution almost looks linear, but it's not due to the presence of this maximum operator as well as the expectation operator. So we can't algebraically solve for the optimal best solution, which is V star. 
As a result, we need iterative methods for dynamic programming in order to solve for the optimal policy. And here, as we said, we look at two methods, value iteration and policy iteration. We have a brief look at these, and there are many more variants and other methods that we can use to solve, but this is just to give you an idea of the simplest possible way in order to solve for the optimal solution in MDP problems with stochastic control. So how does value iteration work? Well, value iteration essentially iterates over possible values of the states until they converge. We start with the value function operator, um, the optimality operator, which we simply had from the previous slide. And the basic algorithm is as follows. So first we take all our states in our MDP and we initialize them with a starting value. Then we follow an iterative process, updating every state value given the best possible action that we can take. So we have to loop through all the states several times, updating the state value based on the best possible action we can take in that state at a given iteration. And here, k, not to be confused with time, is the iteration operator, which is why it has a different letter. So if we do this many times, it can be shown that the value iteration procedure actually converges to the optimal values. And there we have a solution to our MDP where we know the value of each state of our state space and we can simply follow them in order to find the optimal policy that gives us the highest possible gain in terms of reward. Another method is policy iteration. So here we try to understand the fact that in practical applications, we don't need to know the value of each state in our state space. All we care about from the perspective of the agent and decision maker is what it has to do. In other words, it's policy. Remember, a policy is simply a mapping from the states to the actions. And what we're interested in is the actions, which tell us what the agent should be doing in that particular state. So it's not necessary to know all the state values as we do in value iteration. Instead, can we do something in order to refine our policy incrementally in a similar way? And what we do here is, again, we follow an iterative method alternating between two steps. So we start with an initial policy Again, here subs uh, subscripted by zero. This is the first iteration that we have, and this could be any action. And what we do is evaluate the policy. So assuming I have this policy that's fixed, that's known, I can calculate the value of a state. And why can I do this? It's simply because I know the action that I take, the policy tells me. So the only variable for the value, uh, state value function there is the actual state because the policy is just something that we assume to have. And by doing this step, what this tells us is exactly policy evaluation. So how useful is this policy in that particular state? What's the value that I get if I follow those particular actions? And then uh, here comes the iterative step, which is policy improvement. So with policy improvement, what we do is we calculate, um, we update the policy by calculate the map maximum expected utility. So we change our policy there, we improve it by taking the best possible action that we can take according to our action value function. And we repeat these methods, um, these two steps, so evaluate the policy and update it until the entire policy converges to the optimal policy. And remember, the optimal policy is always the one that brings the highest reward. So what this does is um, does not consider the state value of every single state, but rather we function in the space of policies in order to find the best possible actions until they converge. And the best way to really understand these two methods is to look at what the 
what the difference is between the action uh, value and the state value functions and what they actually represent. So in policy evaluation, we assume a policy. A policy is known, it is given. And in policy improvement, we try to improve it by looking at what could be the best possible thing to do. And then we loop through. So here is um, a visual example of value iteration happening in a grid world where we have some goal here on the top right and we basically apply value iteration to iterate on all the uh, values of all the states and remember a state here is corresponding to a cell in our grid world. So at the starting iteration, let's say all the states were in initialized with value zero we can see how the reward um, of reaching the goal effectively propagates. And this is because we're using value iteration, looking at every possible step and refining it using the iterative approach. Now, what if um, we apply the same, um, in, for the same problem, policy iteration? So this is what it looks like. So here we can see the iteration uh, number on the top and the policy is evolving. So uh, the northeast south, uh, the letters simply correspond to northeast southwest, which is the next action that the robot should take, assuming that it can go to any of the four adjacent cells here towards the goal. And at the for starting iteration, the policy looks uh, rather garbage, but as the method converges, what we see is that each state actually points to the next state that's closer towards the goal. So if I put a robot in any of the states, given the optimal policy after this algorithm converges, I will know exactly where to go. And thus, the algorithm will provide me with the shortest possible path from the start to the goal if my objective is to um, actually optimize for this. One thing to note here is that policy iteration converges here in about 20 iterations, whereas um, a value iteration uh, has converged in the previous slide in around 25. So policy iteration could have the potential advantage of being quicker about some problems because we focus on the policy and we operate directly um, looping the iterations in this space rather than going through all the states. So there are many more methods of solving MDPs and they all have different features, but these are two algorithms so that one can see in a practical example how can we actually get the best possible policy um, using iterative methods. Great, so that brings us to the conclusion of this lecture. So um, in the first part we looked at the decision-making problem and its key components. We said that the general aim of sequential decision making was to maximize the expected cumulative reward that the agent can get from one particular state. Remember our mission will define what the reward looks like and then our decision making algorithm will try to get as much reward as possible so that our mission can be more successful. Here we'll look at um, the interaction between the agent and its environment what are observations, actions, and reward, how to formulate state transitions. Then we took these concepts and we developed and defined the Markov decision process, which is a general framework for sequential decision making. Here we looked at how um, we can formulate decisions in terms of policies that map states to actions, and we also looked at the concept of returns and what this means in terms of uh, the value of states and the value of state action pairs. So corresponding to that, we had state, um, state value functions and action value functions. We then use uh, recursive principles to break these uh, functions down into Bellman's equations, which are fundamental for solving MDPs because they break um, um, com a complex uh, value from one state into an immediate reward plus the discounted value from the next state. 
And then finally, we took these concepts and saw how they can be applied in a dynamic programming context, covering value iteration and policy iteration. So these are all extremely practical methods for practical decision making, decision making under uncertainty that we can use to guide our robots to act as truly intelligent agents and perform successful missions. Moving on, there is plenty um, of further reading out there for you to do if you're interested in this concept. It's highly recommended especially to look at um, some other examples that are presented here and how these concepts, um, the theory that was presented here, how it can actually be applied in practical examples and how this actually looks like if you want to implement it on our robots. So it is very recommended for you to go and explore some of these um, further readings and others that you might find out there. Thank you for your attention.